Hey everyone, welcome to the church at RV Online. We have a great service plan for you as Pastor Jared returns to the stage to continue the series, Seven Blessings. I'll be right back to go over a few announcements, but first, let's worship. Grace for the day. 
Welcome back. First, I just want to say thank you for tuning in. We absolutely love being able to be in God's presence with you. Last week, Josh Hudson Pillar taught us how to kill giants by being a giant. G I A N T. If you don't know what that stands for, make sure you go back and check out his message. This week, Pastor Jared will be continuing the series Seven Blessings, which we'll get to in just a few moments. But before we do, I have a few things I want to share with you. Last Friday, our worship band Garden Music released their new album, Songs for the Weary. Right before we came back to the building for in-person church, Garden Music recorded some songs reflecting on the weariness of that time and trusting God and his ability to get us through. This album is all about acknowledging those moments when your strength just isn't enough and celebrating the God whose strength is perfect. So as you're listening, I encourage you to remember that time and think about how God has pulled you through. You can find it on all streaming platforms today. Coming up on October 7th is our next boardroom gathering. Here's Josh to tell you more about it. Hey, what's going on men of Rancho Bernardo? My name is Josh Hotson Pillar, and I have the amazing opportunity of leading our boardroom every month. October 7th at 7 p.m., we're going to gather in this atrium. We're going to fill it out and we're going to deposit God's word into our lives. We said that there's no way that there's going to be the same amount of people in this room as there was last time. There's going to be less, there's going to be more. We want to be a church of more. So make sure that you show back up, bring somebody with you, deposit God's word in your life so that you have deposits to put into the lives of others. October 7th, 7 p.m. Can't wait to see you here. Ladies, we also have our next greenhouse meeting on October 20th, so mark your calendars. I know we had a wonderful time getting to know each other and growing together, so I hope you can make it to the next one. If you're interested, text your name to the number below for updates. If you've been here a while, you know we have daily devotionals that you can sign up to receive by text every day. We are now super excited to announce you can listen to our devotionals with our new podcast. If you already received text, then you're good to go. If not, text the number below to subscribe. And finally, our church is passionate about fostering a deeper connection to Jesus in every area of life. We believe that one area God can uniquely grow our trust in him is in our finances. When we live generously and give to the mission of his church, we're participating in an act of worship that develops our connection to God. If you are in a position to give, visit crb.gives today. Now here's Pastor Jared continuing our series, Seven Blessings. Morning, 10 o'clock. How we doing? So good to see you. If you are just joining us, we are in the middle of a series called Seven Blessings. And the heart behind this series is looking at the endless connections between the Old and the New Testaments. And I think often uh, we read the Old Testament, but we glide by it because we're just trying to get to Jesus. And I understand that at a certain level, but the Old Testament unlocks powerful truths over our lives. And until we read the New Testament scriptures in light of the old, it's, it's what Augustine said several years ago, or 1,600 years ago. Uh, he said that the, the old is revealed in the new, and the new is concealed in the old. And there's one uh, beautiful story over our life. And so what we've been doing in this series is week in and week out, looking at a, a passage, uh, looking at a story, looking at a person, and seeing how the Old Testament unlocks a blessing over our life. And we've talked about the blessing of creation. We've talked about the blessing of blessing and Abraham. And today we're going to look at the life of Isaac, the son of Abraham, and look at the blessing of forgiveness. The New Testament has at its center this idea that you are forgiven. 
And this is good news. This is the announcement of the New Testament, that God has forgiven you through the cross. We are people of the cross. And we come to the cross and we receive uh, a gift over our life. That's the, the first announcement of Christianity. If you are on the outside looking in of, of the Christian faith and you're not quite sure you know, what it's all about, it starts with that announcement that you don't owe God anything. And it's what DJ was saying earlier that through those songs we were singing, death has been arrested through the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. There's life that is offered to you. And the, what I want to explore today is, is that forgiveness is not just something you receive. It's not just a blessing where you say, oh, wow, I received that from God. But we're called as the people of God to mobilize in the world and to be dispensers of that forgiveness to our coworkers, to our family members, to our neighbors, to our brothers and sisters. And I think the world can use a little forgiveness and grace right now. And it's on the people of God to take that mantle and say, uh, I, I want to receive this gift from God, but I also want to be a conduit of it to the world. Lewis Smead said several years ago uh, in his book, Fit, Forgive and Forget, that forgiveness is when you set a prisoner free only to realize that you are that prisoner. And I don't know if it's somebody 20 years ago in your life or 20 minutes ago in your life uh, that you need to set free, but it's, it's you who's in captivity to that. And it's through looking at the cross and the person of God, the person of Jesus that we receive and then we dispense into the world. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screens or the CRB app is a great place to follow along as well. And I want to look at the story of Isaac. And before we get there, I want to give you a little context on uh, his dad, Abraham. Genesis 12 told us that he was blessed. He stepped out in faith. He left his family. Uh, at 75 years old, Abraham finally moved out of the house. <laughs> Anybody annoyed your 28-year-old still living with you? <laughs> Give it time. They're just very spiritual. Uh, a day's coming where the generations will be blessed through them. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Abraham. Genesis 13 is where uh, we pick up. And he stepped out in faith and God said, I'll bless you. Well, Genesis 13 Apparently, a truckload of blessings have fallen on him and to uh, his nephew, Lot. It says this, verse 5 of Genesis 13. It says, now Lot, and Lot, uh, often we think of him as, as Abraham's brother. Uh, technically, he's his nephew. And uh, Lot's uh, father was killed by King Nimrod. That's a real name, by the way. Uh, which means, if you've ever called somebody a Nimrod before, it's actually a very biblical phrase to use. Uh, but he's killed by Nimrod, and now he's traveling through the world with his uncle Abraham, and they can't really get along. There's a lot of conflict between the two. You get the sense Abraham, Abram is like, man, my, my idiot nephew just kind of dragging him along. He's on my coattails. And here they go. Now, Lot was moving about with Abram, and he had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them. You get a picture if this is a movie. It's like they're traveling through the wilderness with a Bass Pro Shop of all kinds of wilderness gear. Now the land could not support them while they stayed together for their possessions were so great, which is an interesting line, that they were not able to stay together. Anyone ever seen money ruin a relationship? <laughs> uh, that's essentially what's happening here. And quarreling arose between Abram, Abraham's herders, and Lot's. And so, essentially, uh, what happens in their family, uh, Lot and Abraham, they acquire so many possessions that eventually this fractures their relationship. Uh, I mean, you've seen this before. Money, uh, whether in your family, whether in your life, you want to get blessed. Genesis 12, he gets the blessing by Genesis 13. The blessings produce all kinds of complications to his relationship. And Lot is the kind of guy, his stuff owns him. Abraham's the kind of guy, he actually owns his stuff. And Abraham is the peacemaker again and again. By chapter 19 of Genesis, Lot, his life has gone off the rails. Abraham is still being blessed because he's still being obedient to God. And even though he's acquired all this stuff, he's, he's still faithfully following God. He doesn't allow the stuff to dictate his choices. I mean, isn't it true, if you're honest, for some of us, it was way easier to trust God in your 20s than it is now? 
That was the day if God said to move, you're like, it'll take me a morning. I just, two cardboard boxes of stuff and put it in the trunk and where are we going, Yahweh? Here we go. Uh, but now uh, it's, it's way harder. Uh, mortgage, kids. Uh, well, Abraham's the kind of guy, he keeps trusting and following God. And God blesses him. He has a, uh, a son named Isaac and at 100 years old, which I love that. Uh, at 100 years old, he has his first kid. <laughs> Uh, and uh, your best days may be in front of you. You don't know. <laughs> and Isaac is essentially uh, the, the, the carrier of the blessing. The blessing comes to Abraham, and he's blessed to be a blessing. All these nations, uh, seed, uh, children, soil, land are going to come through him. Well, Isaac is the, the bearer of this blessing, and he's the one who's going to carry it through the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And so the story of Abraham really, uh, it, it happens again in Isaac. They're, it, it's like Junior. It's the same thing. The, it's a sequel to the Abraham story when Isaac comes into the world. Uh, Isaac is a, a grown-up at this point, And he's in Philistia. These are the David and Goliath people. And I want us to see this conflict that he gets himself in the middle of. Now, his father was always a peacemaker. Abraham did a pretty good job of it. But he, he's probably heard stories somewhere along the way about Uncle Lot and the crazy things that he would do and the way he would fight over land. And Isaac knows that's an option, but he, he wants to be a peacemaker in the conflicts of his life. And this is the story. Uh, Genesis chapter 26, starting in verse 1, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, and besides the previous famine, in Abraham's time. Now, Abraham's uh, been dead for quite some time. Isaac is on his own at this point. And it says, Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And so uh, he's, he's in Philistia, enemy territory. And the Lord appears to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Now, in the ancient world, this is still true. If there's a famine, what do you do? You leave. Uh, you go somewhere that's prosperous. But that's not what God tells him to do. Where Abraham, he said, Abraham, get thee out. For Isaac, he says, stay thee in. I want you to be in Philistia. But he knows to stay in Philistia is going to produce all kinds of problems and conflicts because it is hostile territory. And he obeys. Now he sees the same thing Abraham sees. Through his obedience, God blesses. Through his obedience, surrendering the outcomes, God is going to bless him. And it says this, verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land, in Philistia. And the same year, he reaped a hundredfold uh, because the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. So he's carrying on the lineage of prosperity of his father. He had so many flocks and herds and servants, all the status symbols of the ancient world, that the Philistines envied him. You would too, by the way. Uh, here you are in Philistia, and your crops have dried up. There's a famine. And here you have Isaac, who is a foreigner, and he's buying his seventh Porsche. Uh, that's sort of the, the picture that you get. He had so many flocks and herds and his servants uh, and, and the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth or with dirt. Now, uh, we'll see this in just a second. Abraham had lived in this exact same place some 75 years earlier and he had dug wells uh, to provide nourishment to his flocks, to his herds, to his servants. This is what you did in the ancient world. Uh, it says, then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Abimelech, the king of Philistia, sees this guy who does not look like him, does not speak his language, and says, you have to get out of here. Uh, you have become too powerful. Now, if you go back 75 years, Abraham and Abimelech Sr. 
Now you have Isaac and Abimelech Jr. But 75 years earlier, this well that they, they've thrown dirt in uh, was, was the well of Abraham. And there was some kind of peace treaty that was made at this well. Genesis 21, uh, I'll just read this very, very quickly. It says, then Abraham, Isaac's father, complained to Abimelech, which was, uh, most historians believe, is Abimelech Jr.'s father. He was the king at that time. Complained to him about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this. You did not tell me about it, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham, verse 27, brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a treaty. So 75 years earlier, this comes into play in a moment, uh, 75 years earlier, this very well had been a place of peace and treaty and a covenant established between their fathers. 75 years later, Isaac and Abimelech, this very well has become a place of controversy. And the reason is it's, well, it's just good old fashioned jealousy. Uh, jealousy is that thing in our heart where often the conflict begins. It's where someone's hatred or anger or frustration began with you. And jealousy is, is, it hides in our heart. It's not one of those sins that anybody ever admits. It's kind of like greed. Nobody ever would say, you know, my big struggle is greed. You know somebody who's greedy, <laughs> but you would never say about yourself that you're greedy. Uh, jealousy is the same way. You would never say, you know, I'm really just jealous. Uh, it, it, jealousy, in fact, it hides in our feelings of moral superiority. Moral superiority is often, uh, it, it's, it's jealousy dressed up. And uh, essentially, uh, what, what happens here, I hope everything's okay back there. I really do. Uh, and I hope it's not one of my children. Uh, Abimelech, uh, Abimelech uh, essentially what happens here uh, sorry. <laughs> I hope I didn't make her feel bad. I, uh, <clears throat> oh man. Okay. Where are we? Gosh. You know, I'm so used to this at my house. Uh, all the, anyway. Uh, so <laughs> in this particular, uh, story, what's happening is he's throwing mud into the well of, of Abraham uh, and he's doing it because he's jealous. Now, jealousy is, is essentially, it's, it dresses itself up in our life in terms of moral superiority. There we go. Uh, moral superiority. <laughs> and uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, doing my best. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, how does that work? Uh, let me explain it this way. Several years ago, I was living in Dallas, Texas. And uh, some friends of mine from my church, we went to another friend's house that we knew, but we didn't know him very well. And we pulled up at his house and he had this palatial estate and, and none of us knew this was his house, his land. And we were sitting in the car and uh, this other gentleman from our church, he made a comment, something along the lines of, uh, well, if he was really a good Christian... Uh, he would sell this place and he would give the money to the poor. Well, well didn't you pick an interesting time to get charitable, Frank? Uh, <laughs> was that statement made from a spirit of charity? Or was that statement, yeah, was it made from a spirit of jealousy? Of course. It was a spirit of jealousy. Uh, what I know about everyone who was in that car, uh, and the conversation sort of turned in that direction, yeah, man, this seems like a... Uh, it, everyone in that car, all, just like everybody in this room, all in the top 1% of the world's wealth, nobody up until that moment had had any discussions about selling any of their possessions and giving anything to the poor. But all of a sudden, jealousy dressed up as moral superiority. This is what begins to happen. Now, in this case, what do they do? He begins to follow 
Isaac around and he's throwing dirt literally into the signs of prosperity that he has. Let me ask you a question. Who is it that's shoveling dirt into your wells today? Uh, Who is it that is following you around? Who is it in your life, at work, in your family? Uh, They're literally mudslinging in your direction. Their anger, their agitation, just like Abimelech, it's not at you. It's that God has given you something that God has not given them. And what may be a a moral superiority, well, I'm better than him, I'm better than her, uh, is actually deep, it's just good old-fashioned jealousy. Who is it that is reaching for the shovel when you walk in the room and they're slinging mud in your direction? On the other side of it, who is it when you hear their name, when they come up in conversation at dinner, you can see the conflict coming and you are tempted to shovel dirt in their direction. Now, you never think of it that way. Uh, You think of it as moral superiority. It comes in a thousand different ways. I'll give you another example. It's that moment where uh, maybe they pull up in their car. Maybe it's that moment where you go to their house. Maybe it's that moment when you see they're talking about a vacation or something, and you and your spouse get in the car, and you're driving home from their house, and you're like, well, that certainly was a nice house. I didn't know they, uh, I even saw a a Mont Blanc pen on the counter. Where do they get that kind of money? Did they say they're going on vacation to Tahiti? What did that, did he say he's in sales? What does he sell? He sells drugs. I bet he sells drugs. (laughs) Ah, Well, we may not be as prosperous as them, but at least we're not drug dealers. (laughs) I'm so proud of you, honey. (laughs) Earning your honest living. And all of a sudden, uh, moral superiority. It's just jealousy dressed up. And who is it? When they walk in the room, you find yourself ready to throw some dirt in their direction. Who is it that, yeah, maybe they're throwing dirt in your direction right now, and it has nothing to do with you, which Isaac understands. We'll see this in a second. And he's able to shake the dust off and move on. Uh, But who is it that the conflict begins in jealousy? Um, It's an opportunity for peace. It's an opportunity uh, to demonstrate reconciliation. Now, you keep going in this uh, story. I love Isaac. He just keeps moving on. But notice uh, the, the conflict keeps escalating. It says, verse 19, it says, Isaac's servants, apparently they left his father's well, And they went and they dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac. The herders of Gerar are Philistines. These are Abimelech's guys. And they said, the water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. Uh, You have any herders of Gerar in your life? Everywhere you go, there they are with the shovel just ready to hurl some dirt in your direction. Doesn't matter what you accomplish, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter how proud you are of yourself, whatever. Uh, There they are with a shovel, just waiting to throw mud and dirt in your well. And notice the conflict escalates. Uh, It starts in jealousy, but now uh, the scriptures say he's moved on uh, to, to Essek. And in Essek, uh, this word Essek is actually, the, the Hebrew word is where we get the word lawsuit from in the English language. And so essentially what's happened is this has gone from jealousy just in the head. Now it's a confrontation. Jealousy never stays there. It escalates. What started in, in, in the head of the herders of Gerar in Abimelech. Now it's actually a confrontation. And you you have to love Isaac. He's demonstrating for us. What does he do? He doesn't throw mud back in their direction. He just moves on. Uh, Isaac has this sense. It doesn't matter where I go, what I do. Uh, My God is not a God of scarcity. My God is a God of abundance. There will be another well for me somewhere. And I'm not going to lock horns with the herders of Gerar. And maybe that's the thing you need to write down in your Bible today. Not going to lock horns anymore with the herders of Gerar. Kathy from accounting. Not locking horns with Kathy from accounting. (laughs) 
And you don't have to say it that way. You don't have to respond to her when she writes you a nasty email and you put back in all caps, Dear Herders of Garar. <laughs> but you know, I'm not going to shovel dirt back. And Isaac moves on. He's modeling what Abraham had modeled, a way of peace. When the conflict began with Lot, what does Abraham do? He moves on. Uh, this is exactly what Isaac is doing. So he continues to go, and it says that Isaac's servants, they dig again. Uh, then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. So we're three wells in on the story, and this well he calls Sitna. Sitna is, uh, it would translate to us as uh, quite literally Satan. Uh, it would be accuser. The name that Satan, the title of Satan in the Hebrew scriptures is Hasatan or accusation. He's the accuser. Uh, and essentially this is escalated. It, it, it starts in jealousy, then it's confrontation, then it's at that moment of accusation. Now you are saying things. There's the slander, there's the gossip. Uh, the, the dirt has gotten darker and more bitter. And essentially, in that moment, he names it Sitna, which I think Sitna happens in our life. It's that moment when all of a sudden, the, the jealousy, the confrontation turns and escalates, and it's dark. And now all of a sudden, you're slandering, you're gossiping, you're saying hateful things. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're bitter in your heart against that person. And quite literally in that moment, when you slander somebody, you have opened your head and heart up to the enemy— to come sit at your table and to eat your lunch, and he's going to do it. And it often feels like, well, it's just a confrontation between me and that person. It's just me running that person down. But it's bigger than that, and it involves far more. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 4. He says in verse 26, he says, Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. What does that have to do? What does my temper have to do with the devil, Paul? Well, when you're angry at somebody, and it's that person that they did something on Tuesday and Friday, you're having imaginary conversations with them in your head. You know what I'm talking about? And you always win those imaginary conversations. You ever notice that? You're a hundred and O in those moments. It never comes out that way, but it's that person. It's, it's the conflict that you drag into the next day and the next day and the next day. He says, no, I want you to make peace that day. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And if you do, if you drag it into the next day and the next day and the next day, and you just keep carrying the shovel with you, you've given the devil a foothold in your life. And the enemy now has access to you that you gave him through unresolved conflict. And he says, I want you to be the kind of person who unstraps the U-Haul of bitterness from you and sets it down and begins to make peace. There, there's this other fascinating verse in Hebrews that has, has always bothered me, but I, I, I think there's a beautiful connection here. He says it this way, or the, the writer of Hebrews says this. We, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Uh, so we'll say uh, this person said this, see to it. That no one falls short, verse 15, that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. That something about the bitter roots that are buried deep beneath the soil of your heart, they grow up and they cause trouble and they defile you. He says many. And then he goes on and he says this, see to it that no one is sexually immoral and these are not disconnected thoughts. Or is godless like Esau, who's the son of Isaac. And he says, hey, I want you to dig up the bitter roots in your life so that it doesn't defile others and lead essentially to sexual immorality. Connect the dots for me there, writer of Hebrews. Well, what is that about? I think he's saying, hey, if you have sexual immorality in your life, and you can't control your sexual appetites and desires, and 
you're like, I got to get rid of that. I don't want to live that way. It's causing destruction in my marriage. It's causing destruction in my dating life. It's, it's, it's wreaking havoc here. I don't want to be this person. Instead of just trying to cut that branch off of your life, you have to deal with the root of bitterness somewhere in your story that's actually causing that branch to grow. And that some fractured relationship in your past, some bitter root, it could be from your childhood, it could be from an old business deal, but you carry a bitter root and you've got to turn the shovel in, inward to dig that bitter root out. And before you, you can deal with the sexual immorality in your life, you have to dig up the bitter roots that are there. You say, what does that have to do, what, what does sexual immorality have to do with relational conflict? What is sexual immorality? Sexual immorality comes from a spirit of entitlement. I'm going to take what is not mine. And where in your story does that entitlement come from? It comes from some bitter root beneath the soil where somewhere along the way you felt injured, you felt like somebody owed you something, you didn't get what you deserved, and you felt slanted, and it never got resolved. It was just a bitter root of, of, of entitlement and hatred that got buried, and it will grow up, and it will defile many, and it will cause sexual immorality in your life and in your story maybe 20 years later. And if you want to deal with this, you got to dig up the bitter root where you've given the devil a foothold. I'm like, why am I sitting at Sitna today? Well, it's the bitter root from Essek. It's the bitter root of jealousy. It's the bitter root from back here that has caused the conflict to escalate and defile all these other relationships in your life. It has that kind of power over you. And you go, well, I want to do that. How do I, how do I dig that out? Well, he, he says eventually... He, he gets to a place of peace, which is where we want to be. Verse 22 of 26. Now we're at the fourth well. It says he moved on from there and he dug another well and no one quarreled over it. Thank God. And he named it Rehoboth saying, now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. Rehoboth means wide open spaces. There's no quarreling in Rehoboth. There's no bickering in Rehoboth. And you go, man, that's where I want to be. And maybe you, you need a space like that in your life. Like, I, I need Rehoboth. How do I get there? Well, you can't get to Rehoboth if you're stuck at Essek. If you're still all the way back in Essek, throwing dirt and making accusations against somebody, you can't get to Rehoboth if you're sitting in Sitna and you're in bondage to the enemy and you still have bitter roots beneath the soil that you have not dug up and brought to the person of Jesus Christ to heal and, and to be forgiven so you can dispense that forgiveness. And it's not until you go back in your story and dig out the bitter roots and put down the shovel and begin to heal the, the broken, mud-slinging relationships, on the other side of that, the blessing of Rehoboth comes. Peace, wide open spaces, finally the quarreling. <sighs> And he gets there. And you can get there too. And you say, well, how do I, how do, I do that? That's, that sounds nice. Well, you do exactly what Abimelech of all people does. Because he comes back in the story. And I love this. And this is in an ancient society, tribal people. This does not happen, but it happens between Abimelech and Isaac, verse 26, it says, Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with, a, a zoo, with ZZ Top. <laughs> His personal advisor. Uh, they all had long beards, it works. And Fickle, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me you shovel bearers, since you were hostile to me and sent me away. In other words, guys, <clears throat> I'm here in Rehoboth because you drove me out of Essek. 
You threw mud anywhere I went. Why are you here now? And he gives a beautiful response. He says this. He says, well, they answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, which Isaac's got to be like, what? Fickle, what are you talking, like, what are you, what's going on? And he's saying to him, he's going, look, when you were digging all these wells, we were able to see that God was with you by how you responded to our mudslinging. And it was obvious to us, man, God must be with him. Because when you got mud thrown on you, you did not throw it back. And it was a sign that God was with you. Would your enemy say that about you? It's so obvious that you have a peace. You're, not, you're a non-anxious presence in the world. When other people get mud thrown on them, you, you don't respond like they do. And he says, God was obviously with you. So let's make a covenant. Let's establish some kind of bond. And he says this, Isaac, then apparently he offers forgiveness and he makes a feast for them. And they ate and they drank. And early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other, Isaac and Abimelech. And then Isaac sent them on their way and they went away peacefully or in shalom. And that day, Isaac's servants came and they told him about the well they dug. These guys just keep digging wells, man. And they said, we found water. And this is the fifth well of Isaac. He called it Shabbat which means uh, it's, it's the, the number seven or wholeness in the Hebrew mind, completion. Uh, the, the circle is closed, essentially, is what it means. And this story, uh, the old is, is revealed in the new. The, the New Testament tells you exactly what this story is about. This story is about coming to the person of Jesus Christ. All these stories, they point to the person of Jesus and they unlock a blessing over you and over me in our lives. And, and who, in, who are you? Who am I in this story? Well, we are Abimelech. And the power of this story is when you realize in your life, it does not matter how much mud you've slung. It doesn't matter how dirty you've gotten in your life. If you come to the son, he is faithful to forgive and he will establish a covenant and an oath of forgiveness of unconditional love with you. He will prepare a feast for you and allow you to sit at his table as the son of God. And he will send you away in shalom and in peace. And he offers forgiveness. This story is a story about what Christ is going to do for you and how you and I receive forgiveness. You can come limping into the presence of Jesus like Abimelech came limping into the presence of Isaac. And just like Isaac, the son of Abraham, Jesus, the son of God, will forgive and announce forgiveness over you. And he will make a covenant with you that no matter what you do, you are forgiven and his grace flows in your direction. And this story points to the power of the gospel in your life and in my life and what it unlocks over you and what it unlocks over me. But at the same time, there's another nuance and there's another layer to this. And it can't be lost on us that, and maybe it's just me, but 75 years earlier, Abimelech had seen, heard about, I imagine he was there as a little boy playing in the dirt. Maybe Isaac was there as a little boy playing in the dirt. And 75 years earlier in the exact same place, they had watched their fathers set their shovels down and make a covenant of peace. Listen, you have no idea what hangs in the balance with your decision to forgive and to reconcile with somebody. Little eyes are watching and forgiveness is not just about you and about that person. It's about the example of forgiveness that you establish for the generations of your family. And if you reconcile, maybe it's with a parent, Maybe it's with a brother, a sister. Maybe it's that person that nobody else wants to talk to, but you decide to, sh to set the shovel down and to pick up the cross and be the reconciler. You model, listen, you model 
for your sons and your daughters something in that moment, that it might be 75 years later that your family is blessed through your act of obedience and your act of forgiveness. There's a power that's about far more than you can see in this moment with your act of forgiveness. I you see a question, are you sitting in Sitna today? Are you sitting in jealousy today? Are you in ethic and confrontation today? We are invited as the people of God to receive forgiveness and then dispense it to somebody who needs it, only to find out that who needs it is us and our sons and our daughters and those who are watching. You have no idea what hangs in the balance with your faithfulness and your obedience. Let's pray together this morning. God, I pray over a mom who has busted roots of anger, and bitterness. And it's easy to come to church and it's easy to sing. It's so much harder to pick up the phone. It's easy to talk about the scriptures. It's so much harder to go live the scriptures and be a reconciler and to bless somebody with forgiveness. And I pray today, God, by your power, by your strength, would she come to the Father today through the Son and through the person of Jesus? And would she be reconciled to you in her heart? Would she be reminded of the grace that you give her? And would she dispense that grace into the world? It might be a phone call, it might be a letter, it might be a relative who's passed away and she just needs to set the shovel down and lay claim to the cross today. God, I pray for somebody within the sound of my voice, maybe they've never received the forgiveness of God and they came in today and they're limping like Abimelech. They've been carrying all the, the dirt, the shovel, they've been slinging mud in other people's direction and they feel dirty today. They feel like they're unclean from all the wounds and wars that they've started. And I pray today, God, would you, through your grace and mercy, dig out the bitter roots, break the bow that's on their back, reconcile, heal, forgive, do what you do, God, so that we can go into the world and we can be reconcilers. You have redeemed us so that we would go and bring redemption to the world. You have forgiven us so we would go and we would bring forgiveness to the world. And it's in Jesus' name that we thank you for that. And all of God's children said, amen, grace and peace. Stay
my